This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Well, they say that water's the new oil. But that's not the only reason you should care about it. You know, I've got a good buddy uh, that every time we're out hiking and he takes a big swig from his camelback, he looks up at the mountains around us and says, life-giving water. We're so grateful for water, aren't we? We need it. But at the same time, we take it for granted. We know that water is integral, important, not just to industry, not just to our functioning societies, of course, but to human survival. So why do we spend so little time actually talking about it. We're going to change it in this episode of Real Talk. March 22nd is World Water Day, and we want you to be well-equipped to talk to your friends, your family, your colleagues, those around you about water. I mean, when's the last time you sat down for 45 minutes or so and really contemplated not just the importance of water in your life, in just about every capacity, but maybe the threats to your water sources, maybe some of the conservation efforts around you. Have you paid attention to what the academics are saying, to what the people on the ground are saying, uh, to people with years and years of experience and understanding about threats to our watershed, or maybe even better, some of the things that we can do to improve the water around us, to ensure that our water sources are there when we need them. We're going to go there with three experts on this edition of a Real Talk Roundtable. It wouldn't be happening without the support of today's presenting sponsor, Business Career College. They've got a pretty clear message for you, and that is that if you're looking for a rewarding and high-paying career, but you don't have a university degree, it's easy to get started today as an insurance professional with Business Career College. In Canada, insurance agents can earn, you know, quickly into the six figures. All they're doing to get started is taking an approved course and passing a licensing exam. Business Career College offers industry-leading approved courses in life insurance, property and casualty insurance. Plus, their expert instructors are passionate about helping you launch your new career. Right now, you can save 15% on any Business Career College insurance course with the code REALTALK. 15% off. That's all one word, REALTALK, when you get started today at businesscareercollege.com. Ahead of World Water Day, we welcome three experts uh, to this edition of the Real Talk Roundtable, and and we'll start with those that are joining us in studio. Andre Aslan is a born and raised Edmontonian. He's the executive director of the Alberta Water Council, which is a not-for-profit organization uh, that brings together groups with diverse perspectives to address provincial water management issues. Andre studied environmental economics and policy uh, and resource economics at the U of A before starting with the council about 15 years ago. It's nice to have you here, Andre. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Yeah, you're, you're joined in studio uh, by the uh, VP, the Associate VP for Agriculture and Environment at Alberta Innovates, Dr. Mark Summers. Awesome to have you joining us in studio, Mark. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. You bet. And rounding out our panel today, uh, and we always want to give somebody a shout out when they've adjusted their schedule to make themselves available. Uh, Dr. Scott Ketchison is an Associate Professor in Canada Research Chair in Hydrological Sustainability uh, at Athabasca University. Uh, Dr. Ketchison leads a field-based hydrology research program that looks at water movement in northern Alberta's landscape, focusing on wetlands, disturbance, and restoration. Scott, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks very much, Ryan. Happy to be here. Yeah, you bet. Uh, Scott, I, I let the other guys know that, you know, the, the spirit of our Real Talk Roundtables is, is casual and candid and conversational. So please feel free to jump in whenever you like to, to add to what you're hearing in comments or, or even questions asked on the show. Why don't I start with you? You know, as World Water Day is upon us, where's your head at? What do you immediately think of on World Water Day? Well, I mean, Ryan, yeah, I thought a lot about that. Obviously, as a hydrologist, I probably think more about water than uh, than many folks. But I mean, thinking about World Water Day, I can't help but start at sort of the global scale. And we know that, you know, there are huge water issues uh, globally. And certainly, they're similar in ways, but different, I suppose, uh, to those that we're facing here in Alberta. But, you know, globally, uh, we see sort of climate change and water is at the center of that piece with more extreme weather 
uh, being driven by differences in in the water cycle and uh, you know those climate extremes like floods and droughts are sort of focused around water of course globally uh, water scarcity is another issue um, both with access to clean water but also for agricultural um, and and food development um, and so yeah that's kind of where I start but then obviously I can't help but think about the current state of of water in Alberta here uh, where obviously much of the province and most of the country uh, for that matter is in some level of uh, abnormally dry conditions uh, up to sort of extreme drought yeah, I feel like a big part of our conversation today is going to be focusing on a lack of water. We're going to be talking a lot today about drought. Uh, but let me keep the, the, the opening question general. Dr. Summers, what do you think of on World Water Day? Yeah, thanks very much. I'm, I'm going to start by doubling down a little bit on the message that, that you opened with, Ryan, and maybe picking up a little bit on what Scott talked about. It's, first of all, see, water is everywhere. It's it's unbelievable. It uh, affects every aspect of our lives. Um, water is needed for our energy industry. Water is needed for our agriculture industry. Um, water is everywhere. So water affects food security. It affects energy security. And even at the, the personal level, you know, I was I was at the Oilers game on Tuesday night. Great overtime win against the Habs, by the big way. Big win. Yeah, big win. Um, and you look around and you can see even in that setting, water is everywhere. In the, the, the drinks that people have in their hands, the surface that the skaters are playing on, and not just professional sports, everyday activities, whether it's cross-country skiing, downhill skiing, swimming, boating, or even in the ones that you don't think about water, running and cycling, you want to keep yourself hydrated. So we're all in this together. What about the heating and cooling systems? What about all the toilets that wow. are flushing? What absolutely. about absolutely businesses right? and residents and absolutely everything? And, you know, picking up on what we talked about with respect to, to climate change, you know, my career has largely been either directly or indirectly in the field of climate change. And while I can say that not everything climate is water and not everything water is climate the two of those are highly interrelated and if you look at the province of alberta i'm going to hone in on the province of alberta the greatest climate impacts will be felt in water in terms of where we get water in terms of when we get water and in terms of how much water we get and frankly we're going to see more extremities in all three of those things and so if we zoom in one layer deeper. Yeah, we're all in this together. I agree. We talked about it affects everyone across the province, but in reality, it affects part of the province more than other parts of the province. And so we have this interesting manifestation of the 80-20 rule in Alberta, where about 80% of the population lives in southern Alberta, where we get about 20% of the water. And so it's going to be felt a little more there. And then if you zoom in even one layer deeper, there are really you know, three main rivers in particular, the Red Deer River, the Old Man River, um, the Bow River, that service a tremendous amount of industrial operations and service significant agriculture operations through irrigation and others. And, you know, well north of a million of people, not hundreds of thousands of people, but on the order of millions of people, um, that's where the impacts are going to get felt uh, most acutely. And so I'll just say that I'm here representing Alberta Innovates and um, our primary priority coming into Water Day and thinking about the drought is to make sure that the province of Alberta writ large has the tools and the techniques and the research and the knowledge necessary to be able to combat this drought and others to come as well as other water related issues and to make sure that water in times of scarcity gets to the places of greatest need. We espouse the principle that everyone has the right to clean and safe drinking water. Yeah, the the idea of, of water as a human right, uh, I, I don't think should be uh, sort of seen as outrageous. Um, and, and again, I know like we'll talk a lot about our home turf and a lot of your work, all three of you and your research is being done in Alberta. It makes sense. You know, the majority of our audience is in Alberta for that matter. So we'll talk a lot about that. But again, when we talk about World Water Day, we, we also find ourselves zooming out, right? We, we recognize that that millions and millions of, of the world's citizens don't have access to clean drinking water. We acknowledge that that probably millions, at least hundreds of thousands of Canadians, uh, in particular First Nations communities, don't have access to clean, reliable drinking water, which is preposterous uh, in this day and age. So there's a million angles of approach on, on World Water Day. Andre, I want to give you a fair chance to, to, to chime in with your opening <laughs> remarks, so to speak. Where's your head at? For sure. Uh in terms of the, the global level of things, I sort of look at it from the perspective of um, 
the world coming together and wrapping ourselves around this critical resource that's important to everything that uh, both these other fine gentlemen said. Um, but really, it's a, in terms of the UN Global Water Day, uh, you know, the, the theme is water for peace. And I like to look at that in terms of what is it that we have in common that you can, sh you can compete against resources and land and all that stuff, but at the end of the day, water is critical to everyone. And so that's something that I think we should be able to focus on and bring attention to. So it's good to have a day where we all sort of focus on these things and just building on the drinking water aspect of it. The UN Sustainable Development Goal number six is focused on providing clean drinking water to everyone. So that's something that the globe has agreed to try and pursue. And so there's a lot of good work going on in that direction. And it applies both in some of the, some of the, le the less developed nations across the world that need more help and right here at home. So it affects absolutely every aspect of our industry, our sectors, our humanity, our aquatic ecosystems, our land ecosystems as well. Our industry, it touches on everything we do. And so I appreciate the opportunity to sit here with these fine gentlemen, and I'm going to get a quote in. I can't remember who said it, but it builds on something that Mark said, and it was that water is the teeth with which climate change will bite. Hmm. Ooh. I like that. The teeth with which climate change will bite. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, of polar ice caps melting. I'm thinking of flooding of coastal communities. Uh, what am I missing? It's the extreme events. And it's the changes to what our current system is that we're not ready for. Okay. Uh, we, we have to talk. We'll obviously talk about climate. Climate change is just woven into everything these days. Uh, whether you're talking, you know, you're talking politics, if you're talking about the carbon tax, if you're talking about whatever, climate change is, is, is going to weave its way into any conversation. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to the real talkers that are joining us, either uh, live streaming the audio on the Mixler app presented by California Closets or joining us on YouTube. We're, we're going to be keeping a keen eye on where your head's at on World Water Day and, and what you do to conserve water. I saw, I saw people sharing the old adage, you know, if it's yellow, let it melt. If it's brown, flush it down. People do what they can in their own households to conserve water. Um, Scott, I saw you, you. I saw you scribbling notes as Mark was talking. What, what, what about his message was particularly resonating with you? Yeah, I, what, yeah. What I was writing down, I scribbled the eighty twenty because you know Mark brought up a really good point that affects uh, water, you know, globally, but certainly in Canada, in Alberta, and it's the fact, especially in Canada, that we've got a huge amount of the population uh, distributed sort of in the southern part of the of the country and in the province in Alberta, and a lot of the freshwater resources are in the northern part. So that, that was what I um, was scribbling down when Mark was talking. I thought it was a good point, and, and it speaks true to the climate extremes that we then moved on to as well, because, uh, you know, it's it's with climate change and it's being driven by water um well it's not being driven by water but the outcome is water the teeth that uh, climate change will bite with and of course you know as things get warmer the atmosphere can hold more water and then we have these big uh, intense rainfall events and at the same time we have intensifying droughts and again it comes down to this sort of issue of water distribution uh both with respect to extreme events as well as uh, just geographically relative to populations. Can I can I ask the three of you, um, you know, sort of to, to give us a, a a state of the province or or a state of the country in in your understanding of the threats to our water sources, the threats to our water security? Like, you know, how 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 bad is it? Or that's a loaded question. Like, let me just ask open mindedly. How are we doing on the waterfront? Because I've, I've, you know, you read some assessments, you hear from some people, you take a look at some of our reservoirs or basins that are typically full and they're not right now. Um, is, is that a shorter term reality? Is that a longer term reality? Andre, your, your eyes lit up as soon as I asked the question. <laughs> Yeah, they did. Uh, and Johnny, I don't know if you have some of those graphs of the uh, the water shortage advisories and the, the drought monitoring that we have uh, in Canada, but um, it's pretty bad. In terms of drought, uh, some of the graphs that you'll see uh, here show that we're in a sort of a one in 50 year drought, which is which is pretty severe. And what makes it even worse is that often drought is localized to a particular region or we know that southern Alberta is particularly susceptible to drought. Uh, but this time we've got more drought spread throughout the province and that makes it worse uh, because we've got other regions that are um, going to suffer from this. And so what happened is when you have multi year drought, that's when things get even worse because we have reservoirs and we have dams and we have the ability to mitigate some of the damage that's going to that's going to affect our industries or our people uh, the reality is the insurance policy that was our reservoir
reservoirs uh, was used up last year. So we've got these reservoir levels that are very low. We've got very low mountain snowpack, uh, which is going to translate into lower river flows. And everyone's going to have to essentially adjust their, their use of water going forward if we're going to get through this together. Uh, and that's sort of the approach that the government has been taking and having these the major water licensees work together to develop water sharing agreements in the south. And the idea is that uh, if everybody takes a little bit less, we'll get through it a lot better than if uh, the people who are entitled to the most water decided to take it all. Because our allocation system is such that the oldest licenses, so the big irrigation districts down south, if they wanted to take all their water, they could. And other people who have licenses, I think it was after about 1951, could essentially be prevented from taking water. Uh, that's very bad for society. So the good news is, and this is sort of the angle that I look at it, I try to be an optimist about it, is that everyone's coming together to try to address this and work together to make it so that everyone can have a slice of the pie uh, rather than, you know, some people are winners and some people are absolute losers. Okay, so, I mean, we, we do need to talk about industry, and this isn't like a pile on industry because we need industry. It employs Albertans. It gives us what we need. But but obviously, two of our biggest industries, agriculture and energy, are, are huge consumers of water. They need it to work. So so how do we reconcile what we need as humans uh, and long-term sustainability with also not just viable industry but dynamic industry? Obviously, people need a healthy economy how do we find that balance mark that's a big part of what you do isn't it yeah absolutely and you know i like to take it similar to andre a bit of an optimistic approach I, I think if you go back to the last major drought that we had in alberta in around 2001 we did as a province a very good job of coming through that drought now this one could be could potentially worse could be a multi-year drought um, but at the same time we have better tools available to us now because of some of the work that andre's team is doing because of some of the work that scott's team is doing because of some of the work that that we've helped advance through alberta innovates in order to um, help prepare us for for this drought and uh, and so you know when you talk about balance you know let, let me take a, a minute if, if you don't mind to be a little self-serving as as you and, want pal. talk a little bit about uh, our, our role at alberta innovate so alberta innovates um we're an organiza innovation organization with more than a hundred year history in the province of alberta um within the alberta innovates umbrella we've got three organizations uh Seifer technologies intech alberta and alberta innovates and between the three of us we are a convener we are a funder we provide supports to entrepreneurs we have research scientists we have research facilities we provide we have uh, testing facilities we are a very powerful and multifaceted innovation organization and because of the broad perspective that we take we're cross-sectoral we're cross-disciplinary um, we can take a broad strategic view and identify sometimes opportunity that that sometimes others potentially could miss um, it also allows us to to think strategically across sectors across time scales and across innovation areas and so you know i liken it a little bit to a house so forgive me for the analogy but um in you know if you think about how i would never wish a disaster to befall anyone's house just to be absolutely clear but sometimes it happens if a disaster were to come upon my house a fire or a flood or whatever we have amazing emergency responders in the province that help to minimize the damage and help to pick up the pieces and move forward that's not the role that we play at alberta innovates the role that we play um, is much further in advance at time through research through um, uh, applied testing and development facilities and funding we help to build a more resilient house so that it's prepared for when those disasters happen and we provide information and techniques and tools and processes that help the emergency responders um, better and more efficiently more more quickly respond in those time of needs and so uh, you know I, I talked about being better prepared this drought um, for example even though it could potentially be, be worse if if you don't mind I might just give a quick example and um, you know this is an example in our role as a funder. And I want to give a, a, a shout out to one of Alberta's leading water thinkers, Kim Sturgis of WaterSmart, and her team, who we worked with, you know, this is more than a decade ago, to build a watershed model and, and you know, understanding the impacts of actions on water flow in the watershed. And you may say, you know, who cares? What, you know, what, what's so good about that? Well, this is really interesting. This, among other things, has changed the way that dams are operated in the South Saskatchewan River Basin um, to help 
uh, uh, do you know predictive modeling based on snowpack, to based on uh, precipitation, uh, uh, how those dams are operated to mitigate high water flows and low water flows. Now, for example, if this practice had been in place prior to 2013, major flooding in southern Alberta, this could have helped mitigate and minimize some of the damage that occurred through that flooding based on the way that um, water flow is managed. So that's, that's one example. Scott, you're a, you do a lot of work in the water aspects of ecosystem restoration. Can, can you take us into that work? I mean, I, I guess for a lot of people, the question would be, uh, is the damage done? You know, is the damage permanent, whether it's human activity or otherwise? Uh, or is there something that we can actually do about this? Can we help the planet heal? Well, certainly, uh, you know, joining the theme of optimism, um, I, I would say uh, we're optimistic that we can um, restore some of these ecosystems. Uh, just briefly to, to some of Mark's points, I'm actually uh, recently got some funding from Alberta Innovates. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for that to do some research looking at uh, the influence of oil sands infrastructure on wetlands. And the whole idea is uh, managing to mitigate the influence. So if we can understand how particular wetland types respond to a disturbance such as uh, a road or a seismic line, then we can potentially help uh, to avoid those uh, sensitive wetland types. Maybe that's more realistic with roads. Um, we can help industry partners sort of map out where to put them. Uh, but when it comes to restoration, one of the projects I'm working on deals specifically with seismic lines. And so if you've ever looked on Google Earth or flown over into Fort McMurray, seismic lines uh, you can see in this video are, are linear corridors that have been cleared for oil exploration. They're originally expected to grow back sort of naturally and lots of them have been have been abandoned and have actually reached a stage of arrested succession, we say, so they aren't recovering uh, on their own. And so that's why I'm working a part, as a part of a team called the Boreal Ecosystem Recovery and Assessment that's led by uh, Dr. Greg McDermott out of the University of Calgary. And the whole idea is to try to help uh, help restore these linear features back to uh, re return to forest cover. And so there are lots of different ways that uh, that people are trying to do that, but mostly around encouraging tree growth. So especially where they cross peatlands, it's wet trees don't like to grow so they artificially create mounds to try to encourage uh, tree growth so that's one part of ecosystem uh, restoration trying to restore these linear features uh, and and another challenge i suppose is working in some of the landscape reclamation where after open pit oil sands mining we basically have to reconstruct entire landscapes from scratch and uh, that is quite challenging, of course. And uh, uh, certainly everything, again, comes back to climate and uh, how these ecosystems respond to uh, varying climactic conditions on, on many different temporal scales, short term, uh, medium term in the boreal, there's sort of a 10 to 15 year uh, climate cycle where it's dry followed by short wet periods. So how do the systems respond to those uh, type of climate signals? And then of course, in the context of longer term uh, climate change. Great, thanks uh, for all of those points. There, you're triggering thoughts in my mind, and I wanted to try and pull it all together. As because it's World Water Day, and we don't often get the chance to have this sort of an audience to really explain to people just how complicated water management is, and just how diverse um, the topics are, and, and how to address them. And uh, so, the Alberta Water Council brings together groups from industry and NGOs and governments and municipalities that all have an interest in water, and we try to address the what we call the three-legged stool, which is you know safe drinking water, aquatic ecosystems that are healthy, and the need need to, for water to support an economy that's sustainable. And so between all of those three things, we get a lot of support from groups like Mark's. And I can, I can attest to the, the value that Alberta Innovates brings as an organization. We work with them regularly. They're on my board. Uh, they supported the project that we recently completed that simulated a very similar drought to the one we're going through right now. Uh, and one of the, uh, the, the operations model that's, uh, that Mark mentioned uh, was critical to our simulation, but also to what's happening right now in, in, the, in developing those water sharing agreements. Uh, and so 
between this complicated need to address all three of those goals and then you throw in that Alberta is an energy producer and a food producer and we're somewhat limited in water there's something called the food energy water nexus which adds a whole other layer of complexity and things that we need to balance and strive to optimize uh, as a region that has all these different demands on it and so we work with great groups like Alberta Innovates and the academic community in Alberta and also Water Smart Solutions as well uh, who, who do a great job and so there's lots of organizations out there that all come together with an interest to try and address these things and uh, it's that's why I'm optimistic is we all work together and we try to go for the same goals okay that that's Andre Aslan if you're just tuning in from the Alberta Water Council Dr. Mark Summers joining us as well uh, AVP with Alberta Innovates and Dr. Scott Ketchison joining us uh, uh, research chair at Athabasca University when we come back I want, I, want, I want to like put you guys in a bit of a tough spot here like because this is the whole point and and that we can't ignore the fact that a lot of people just and I agree with you water does need to support an economy and without a healthy economy the whole thing collapses. You'll find no argument from me there. But there's a lot of Albertans, there's a lot of Canadians that are looking at some of this stuff, you know, the, the coal mining uh, exploration in the eastern slopes and then the threats of selenium into that watershed. And you have Alberta conservatives, southern Alberta conservatives, sounding the alarm, telling the government to knock it off with that permitting. And we have Chief Alan Adam from the, the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation on this show talking about the, the, the Imperial Oil Curl oil sands and the tailings ponds, the toxic leak into the water source there. And, and, and a lot of people, including some people in the chat right now, are going, it's just not worth it and so i want to have a real conversation about how do we determine what's worth it and how do we really get serious about protecting our water i mean i don't know if i want to put direct questions to any of you about alberta's energy regulator because that's when some people start to squirm but a lot of albertans everyday folks right now are going can we even trust the gatekeeper anymore can we even trust the regulator anymore let's get real on this world water day real talk round table that's coming up in just a second but first i want to let you know that this conversation is happening with the support of Athabasca University. That's Canada's open university with world-class accredited online degrees and courses designed so you can complete your education wherever and whenever it works for you. That's a big deal. You know, for a lot of people, the, the hurdle, the barrier to entry is they're not anywhere near a brick and mortar university, or maybe they've got other pulls on their time. They're, they're, they've got a full-time job. They're caring for their parents. They're caring for their kids. You can open up your options with online offerings at Athabasca University. The entire AU experience is designed to fit your schedule. They're driven by a strong commitment to empower learners worldwide. They embrace accessibility and flexibility. You can learn more about that AU advantage by visiting them online at AthabascaU.ca. All this talk about natural disaster, in particular flooding, if heaven forbid you experience that this spring into this summer, it could be a myriad of reasons, spring melt, sewer backup, you name it, Complete Care Restoration has experience restoring properties and rebuilding peace of mind. Uh, for more than a quarter century, their team of professional property restoration experts have been working in and around the metro Edmonton region, way up into northern Alberta, and they're ready to respond 24-7. They hope you never call them, but if disaster strikes, remember Complete Care Restoration. All this talk about looking out for Mother Earth, going green, sustainability. That's the whole point of Kubi Renewable Energy. And as their team grows solar energy solutions across Western Canada, it means that they're hiring up. You can check out the careers link right now at kubienergy.ca for more opportunity, more information on what it looks like joining their team growing clean energy in Canada uh, we're showing you on the screen right now if you're watching on YouTube. This is Canada's first net zero fire hall. A beautiful installation by the team at Kubi Renewable Energy. Can you imagine what they could do on your building, on your barn, on your cottage? You name it, you can dream it up. They can take it to green, sustainable, net zero. It's what they do. Again, the careers link at kubienergy.ca. And for those of you that are looking to get organized this year, you want to declutter. It's your number one priority. We want to put California closets on your radar. You know, the first consultation is always free. I've been through it myself. My wife, Carrie, and I, we sat down with one of their designers. His name was Reese, by the way. Just a brilliant guy. Thought of things we never would have thought of. And you want the tiny little details? He created a spot in one of my closet drawers for my cufflinks. 
How cool is that? He knew that I'm into cufflinks. He created a custom little spot for that. You may go, Jasper, well, I got bigger fish to fry here. Well, their team does massive installations, and they can do tiny little improvements to your boot room, too. And they get into the garage game like nobody else. You can request your free consultation from California Closets today online at californiaclosets.ca. Dr. Scott Ketchison joining us from Athabasca University. Dr. Mark Summers from Alberta Innovates and Andre Aslan from the Alberta Water Council. Scott, at what point uh, do we have to look at water used for industry? We look at some of the stories around us, anecdotal, yes, but very real nonetheless. And we see our watersheds, we see our water sources threatened, and the public starts to push back. How do we have a real conversation about what's happening with water and industry right now? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good question. Obviously, um, you know, there have been some improvements on the industry side for the water use. And I think, um, you know, that's they've invested a lot of time and energy into reducing the amount of water use that they uh, need for to keep up with their production in terms of a, how to have the conversation. I mean, it's it's certainly a tricky one. Um, you know, I, I come to it from a reclamation restoration perspective. So I'm sort of helping to put things back together after uh, the fact rather than um, on the front end of things. But yeah, I think but it's Scott, it's certainly are you a, ever like in your reclamation work? Are you ever looking at a scenario? Are you ever looking at a landscape and going, come on? <laughs> well, I mean, most of the landscapes in the open pit mines uh, don't resemble the boreal forest whatsoever. Um, and so you can't help but think that right off the bat, to be honest. But uh, I guess that's sort of the grand challenge is to try to work. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about multidisciplinary teams and um, and it's a huge challenge. And so to work with the as a part of these multidisciplinary teams to try to put it back to something that resembles what was there previously or, uh, you know, more likely a novel ecosystem, but at least something that has some uh, functions um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's very challenging environment to work in, uh, but you know, we need to do the work to figure out how uh, these systems are going to operate. Mark, the politics of water, this is a thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't mind wading into this with a little bit of trepidation because I will say that um, innovation, the system that, that that I represent is apolitical. Innovation touches every part of the province and affects every Albertan, whether you're whether you're a conservative, whether you're a liberal or a new new Democrat or or, or whatever. But I think, you know, it, this is an important conversation and it's it's absolutely true that we kind of want to have our cake and eat it, too. And I think innovation is one of the ways that we can start to approach that. You know, I'm I'm not qualified to opine on any particular water permit or, or water license. And but I can tell you that nobody goes to work every day, wakes up in the morning and says, hey, I want to go make money by having some people not have access to high quality water. I can I can tell you that I'm you know, I have, again, a, an optimistic view on the, the nature of people. And so what I can say is that, you know, through innovation, I think, is one of the answers to having our cake and eating it, too, through things like water use efficiency. Well, if we can do the same things that we're doing with half the amount of water or less water, that's going to create more water available for other uses. You know, when we were kids, our parents used to tell us a uh, penny earned is a penny a penny saved is a penny earned and I, don't know, I didn't know what the heck they were talking about but it's very much the same in water with some nuances of course you know northern alberta southern alberta within a watershed but if we can have the same industrial operation and increase the water use efficiency which we've we've got examples of um you know through our portfolio and and others that uh, uh, others listening in and and that we've our partners have worked with um to do it with less water that allows for more water to be available. Do we have the political will to protect our water? Like, do you see it, Andre, in your stakeholder consultations and the collaborative work that you're doing? Does it exist? Is there enough political pressure around water yet? So to take it back a step, the reality is we live in a rules-based society. And much to the point that I made that they try to balance out the difference and the needs for aquatic ecosystem health and industrial development and water for communities. These are all things that went into the design of the system. So is it perfect? No. Um, the question is, as a society, how do we value it, right? So how do we assign values and, and, and 
largely when you say political, well, that's people voting, right? So if people are voting for parties that are supporting particular directions in industrial development or the approach that they're taking in managing that water, that, that all comes down to us and Albertans. So we all have a role to play in it. And much to Mark's point, nobody wakes up and says, I think I want to destroy that wetland today just because, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a business imperative to some of the water management and environmental damages that are happening. Um, and uh, building on Mark's point as well, uh, the industries and municipalities, because municipalities use water too, right? It's not like it's just big, bad industry. They're not big, bad industry. They're, they're doing their best to uh, minimize their water use and be good corporate citizens a lot of the time. And the reality is that pumping and cleaning and treating water costs money. So there's a bottom line aspect to it here that they're have, they, have an own, they have their own interest in making sure that they're not using a ton of water or that they're not getting a big target on their back because they're bad corporate citizens, because they're damaging water. So um, in terms of the politics of it, right now when we're in a drought situation, this is where you start to see it. Right? People are concerned. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the coal mines piece. Well, that was an, uh, that was an interesting uh, bring, bring to attention for the water issues that political or not, uh, these affect Albertans, and we care about water. It doesn't matter what stripe your color is. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, the, the provincial government, Minister of, uh, Ministry of Environment, uh, committed about $35 million. Uh, you, you'll have to remind me the specifics of it, I, but I know around water sustainability in particular. Is it enough? Where's, the water, where's that money going to? Can you, can you analyze that so for I, us? I, I'd have to double check my numbers on it, but there's a, quite a, a chunk of money over the next three years dedicated to um, looking at how to free up water because we've got so in the southern part of alberta we've got uh, uh those three basins that uh, that mark mentioned earlier the the red deer and the old man and the bow that are closed to new water license allocations so that basically means it's completely allocated we don't have room to give out any new water uh, and so part of the the funds that have come down are to find ways to free up water to make it more available to make water available for either more commercial or municipal development uh, or industrial development because we're now in a limited system. So now you have to find ways to either trade water or get it to new purposes. Um, and so there's some of the money's gonna look into that. And some of the other funds are gonna be going into the wetland restoration work. So maybe Scott can speak to some of that. And also the watershed resiliency and restoration programs. And so this these funds are uh, available to groups that will likely be doing on the ground work because land and water are in, inextricably linked. You can't do it, but what, what what you do on land affects what's in the water so maybe you can go through and restore riparian areas or maybe you can work with a group like ducks unlimited who's really good at putting wetlands back on the land that have been drained previously so this is all money that will continue to support not-for-profit groups and maybe municipalities to do that on the ground work that helps watershed and ecosystems and the fish and the birds and the bugs and everything that we love about the environment yeah uh, what, what about big water what about, what about like the, the, the big sellers? What about like Nestle, for example? And we, we sell a lot of our water. And what about like, you know, for example, our, our American neighbors uh, that no doubt are looking to Canada? I mean, we, you know, out of the gates, we say, you know, water's the new oil. And I've heard that in a number of different capacities. But I have to believe that our American neighbors are looking at, at one of the, the big values of our relationship geographically to them certainly is Canada's water source would you agree scott like what does the future of water look like with big water and, and the united states the biggest economy in the world well i know um you know we've shared a share a quite a large border obviously with the u.s and because of that there are a lot of rivers that do cross and so water has been a trans boundary issue for quite a long time and there's actually you know commissions andre can probably speak more um more in, in a more informed manner to this, but there are certainly um, water commissions that that deal with the U.S. and Canadian uh, relations, and uh, in these watersheds that span the border, because obviously these catchments aren't don't care where we drew a line on a map. Um, the water moves where it does, and so because of that, it's been a long-standing sort of trans transboundary uh, issue where there has been collaboration. Uh, among Canadian and, and our U.S. counterparts on how to manage that water. Andrew, Andrew, do you see this water being a bigger part of the Canada-U.S. relationship? It already is. Um, so to your early, to your first point, large volumes of water trading across the border is banned. Can't do it. Has to go in a bottle, and I think there's a limit on the size of the bottle. So in terms of water exports to the U.S., uh, currently, that's the situation right now. Could that change? Maybe. Uh, you look at the situation California is in. Uh, we actually have what's called subsidence, which is where the ground is falling because the groundwater is being pumped out to the extent that it's actually all falling. 
So, uh, you know, the, again, this comes down to a societal discussion of value. Where do you want to put the water? Where is it most valuable? How do we value it as Canadians if it's our water? Right? Do we want that? Well, I don't know. But uh, and to Scott's point, we do have uh, inter we have international treaties uh, with the U.S. to manage rivers that cross the borders. A couple times down south in Alberta, the Milk River is a great example. It starts in Montana, comes up. We actually take a bunch of it off and feed our irrigation districts with it, and then it goes back down south into the U.S. And so we have agreements that require uh, th that set out the rules basically of how much water we can take, how much of it has to be returned uh, on both sides of the river. It's usually, uh, it, sorry, it often comes up as something that the Americans feel they're being treated unfairly because they want to take more water out. We have agreements with Saskatchewan. We have to let 50% of the flow in a natural year cross over to the Saskatchewan border. We have uh, an agreement with BC up north and also with the Northwest Territories. I think the, the Northwest Territories one, we have to let 90% of the water through to the Northwest Territories. Um, we have out in Ontario, the International Joint Commission is a really big and important group. At, well, it's not just about water, they do air quality stuff too, but about managing the Great Lakes, right? So all the water and everything that managing those lakes and withdrawals from those lakes, it's huge. It feeds people. It's where a lot of the trade comes through Canada, right? So it's, it's just massive and it's complex, uh, really interesting stuff. But, uh, you know, one day will the U.S. come knocking for a water? I wouldn't, I, I'd argue of that it's, course pro it's probably going to come one day. Yeah. Obviously yeah. they will. It's and I wonder if the politics around water will evolve to be a more protectionist stance. You know, I mean, like Canada's sitting, it's, 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 is it like, am, am I out to lunch and comparing our natural resource of water to our natural resource around oil and gas? Like, am I out to lunch on that? Because it seems to me like Canada is in a, in a relatively plumb position. Um, and it strikes me that kind of one of the roles of, a federal government, uh, if not provincial governments as well, is to protect their own citizens and the security uh, of their own citizens. And a big part of that now and into the future will be water. So think about it this way. If you need the water as an input, it depends on whether or not you need it in the place where it is or whether or not you can ship the product that they need, right? So we've opened up our trade relationship with the U.S. such that companies from all over the world actually can come in and build a factory and um, you know, draw of the, the many resources that Alberta and Canada has to develop this product. And if they're an integrated company, they can ship their product to the U.S. Uh, using our resources. And then we get, whether it's taxes or um, royalties, or so we get some of that in the end anyway. So uh, I guess it depends on whether or not the, the water is required for the geography. And that's where farming is probably the big touch because you can't grow fo food up here like, like you can in the, in the California valleys, right? Yeah. But in terms of economic development, it's already kind of happening. Okay. Uh, what? Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to very quickly uh, pick up on what Andre talked about. It doesn't even about have to be quick. You can say whatever you like. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Uh, no, I was going to say there is a lot of talk about the U.S., and I'm glad Andre mentioned it because there are also significant implications interprovincially. I mean, of course, there are, we talked about watersheds and rivers that sort of flow back and forth between the you know north and south of the U.S.-Canada border. I like to spend some time in the southern B.C. area along the Similkameen Valley, and that's an example. You know, there's waterways along there that kind of cross back and forth over the border. Um, but a lot of our waterways flow east to west. And as Arnish talked about, some flow north. And so we have the luxury and, and the, the benefit of being upstream. You know, uh, we're fortunate to live in Treaty 6 territory here in Edmonton. And we're, you know, one of the first big municipalities, or the first really major municipality along the North Saskatchewan River. The North Saskatchewan, South Saskatchewan, those flow east into Saskatchewan, of course. And, and there, are, there are implications for the decisions that we make if we say you know wanted to do something with water wanted to use more water wanted to ship it out to the south of the border there are implications across the country that we need to be careful of as well mm. that's actually one of the unique characteristics of alberta is our big cities are upstream of all the irrigation and industrial development just about everywhere else it's the other way around so you get a big city so it, in terms of your water treatment and what's available to it and uh, how to manage that uh, in terms of who gets rights to water and everything like that because they're at the top of because people are at the top of the watershed that's actually unique uh, in terms of how you manage the whole situation can i ask you you know how is how does alberta or how do alberta communities do on water treatment or is that too broad of a question do we need to like compare how does edmonton do versus how does red deer do versus how does grand prairie do so there's guidelines that have to be met for water treatments so there are a couple of big systems um throughout the province okay so edmonton serves uh, a whole bunch of communities around it and calgary serves a bunch of communities around it and then after that you've got a number of water commissions that tie together a whole bunch of different communities around one wastewater treatment plant uh, and part of part of the challenge is um 
with people that don't have fresh water. So on some of the First Nations in particular, it, they either, it's either really cost prohibitive to build an entire water treatment plant, and not only that, but to maintain it uh, and to have people working at the plant to, to keeping it up to date. Infrastructure, um, funding is have been falling for, for a while, which contributes to some of this stuff. Not to say that there's not money coming towards it. There was a lot of money in the 2024 budget from the province of Alberta towards municipal systems. So there, there is funding and it is being supported. Uh, in terms of Alberta's water quality, generally speaking, we're pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Look, generally. It's, it's nice to hear, as my friend Lazi would call it, a praise report every once in a yeah. while. It's, it's nice to hear some positive news. And then, yeah, that's a good on-ramp to, to something else that's actually quite related and tying back to what we talked about earlier with respect to climate and with respect to um, other disasters and it, drought and flooding and wildfires, uh, et, et cetera. So you're absolutely right. We do a great job at water treatment. And um, it's what's becoming more clear is that all of these things are more interrelated than you, you might just think on your sort of day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, just to give an example of that, I think, you know, w we all know that more drought or less precipitation, less water can lead to worsening wildfires. Well, worsening wildfires and, and you know, decimation of forest ecosystems um, can make certain areas more susceptible to flooding. Um, and if you think about both wildfires and flooding, those can have implications in terms of water treatment facilities and so you know i want to start by saying that the the water quality in fort mcmurray in particular is very good they do a very good job of providing uh, clean and safe water to the citizens and yet there are still impacts in terms of water treatment that are lingering from the wildfires that happened in fort mcmurray from runoff and from things that get into the contaminants that get into the water system, um, there are still impacts that the water treatment facilities need to deal with. Now, as Andrew talked about, we're fortunate in being upstream, um, but it's in interesting how this kind of all ties back and is all interrelated. And the more that we can build a sort of a resilient house that is the province, a resilient system, um, it will help with drought, it will help with flooding, it will help with wildfires to a certain extent or the impacts of wildfires. Uh, um, and so so that's uh, the, one of the messages I want to leave. Yeah, I, I've, I've, my heart is in my throat. Uh, and I know that people will listen to this. There'll be people that, that watch this on YouTube three, four, five years after we're having this conversation. But, but the timestamp right now in, in the, you know, heading into the spring of 2024 is that we are being told to brace uh, for a devastating wildfire season. We're being told to expect a 50-year drought. We're being told to, to and, and in a way, it almost feels like, I won't say this is being normalized, uh, but the way that we talk now about 100-year floods and 50-year droughts just seems to be, quite frankly, every couple of years. I don't know about, like, Scott, how, how, how do you just as a human, I mean, you're obviously an expert and a research chair and a PhD and all that kind of stuff, but just like as a human, uh, how do you wrap your mind around that? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's something that everyone struggles with, Ryan, to be honest. It's, uh, you know, I can't help but think about um, future generations. I've got young kids and the, just the fact that we've got these completely um, now what seems to be commonly occurring extremes where every year is the, is the hottest year on record. And I think 2023, when we think about wildfires, was I think it was the biggest wildfire season on record. Moving into 2024, like you said, we're kind of bracing, being told to brace for extreme drought and another really bad wildfire season. There are all these uh, warning signs that are in place. And in fact, the wildfire season was declared uh, 10 days earlier than normal this year. We've got carryover fires uh, from 2023 still. So, I mean, it's something that, yeah, I, I do struggle with, to be honest, um, because the effects of of climate change are are up upon us without a doubt yeah it's i mean this is going to become you know it's like we're, we're doing this uh, water round table ahead of world water day but i guarantee you that the conversations around water are going to become more and more and more frequent um i'm grateful that we have expert voices like you we're not rapping yet but to, to be here and talk about it and an engaged audience as well when we come back from this break i want to ask you all about about the theme the united nations world water day the theme this year is water for peace uh, what does that mean to you? Plus, I, I'm going to ask each of you to, to deliver either either an indictment, uh, something
something that you see that is absolutely unacceptable or, like I said, a praise report, something that, that either represents great innovation or, or a sign of encouragement or maybe a, a restored ecosystem, something that, that you think that this audience needs to hear about, something that they can reflect on on World Water Day. This audience as well, I mean, Doobie is here. Um, you know, I mean, I, I guess I we appreciate your optimism, but Doobie is in the chat says, you know, your panel is saying that nobody wakes up and wants to ruin an area for no reason, but people definitely wake up and are more than willing to ruin areas for their own selfish economic gain 100%. And, and a certain part of me is inclined to agree with Doobie is because we know that there are people that don't think very far past their own nose. They don't think 50 years or 100 years down the line. They, they think about right now. Uh, they think about their shareholders. And this is a conversation we need to have. I mean, how many conversations, real talkers, have we had on this show about finding that balance between environmental and economic sustainability? One doesn't have to be the enemy of the other. But, but where do you find that convergence, uh, to use a water metaphor? And, and how do we appreciate and prioritize uh, our water as part of that bigger conversation around industry. I guarantee that this is lighting a fire under a whole bunch of you, no pun intended. I guarantee that a lot of you have something to say on this upon reflection, and we want to invite you to be in touch with the show. You know where to find us. Our inbox is open 24 hours a day. That's talk at ryanjesperson.com. And you've got time to make a submission for the Flamethrower. That's every Friday, our weekly tradition presented by the DQs of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. If you have a hot take on this subject, make sure you email it to the show, put the flamethrower in the subject line, and you could hear your rant read to thousands and thousands of your fellow Canadians. Uh, before we get back to our water experts, I want to put something on your radar. It's happening in our home city of Edmonton this Saturday, March 23rd. This is for the art aficionados, in particular, the sneakerheads. You know who you are. It's a whole subculture, and there's an amazing event Coming up on the 23rd of March at the Harvest Building on 109th Street, presented by Moments by Morel. It's Art is Sneakerhead Edition, uh, a world where art transcends boundaries and embraces the extraordinary. You're going to see a talented collective of local artists all coming together and experience with demonstrations, art installations, and the opportunity to pick the brains, enter the minds of their artists one-on-one. -on -one. Plus, in addition to all the sneakers and all the cool subculture elements there, they've got curated culinary tastings, cocktail experiences, and a portion of the ticket proceeds will go to support the YMCA of Northern Alberta. It all gets started at 6.30 p.m. on Saturday, March 23rd. That's this weekend where art meets soul you see what they did there it's art is the sneakerhead edition you can check out moments by morel that's m-o-r-r-e-l.com to get your tickets or just visit the link it'll be in our show notes on the podcast and on youtube hey all this talk about innovation in particular in industry if this is your wheelhouse if this is what you do or what you want to do our friends at apex automation are hiring right now they're doing a ton of work in mining oil and gas and of course even ship I mean, some of the automation work that they've been doing out on the West Coast and the ports, really remarkable. Robotics, materials handling, AI. Apex Automation is one of Canada's fastest growing automation firms, and they're leveling up. They're scaling up. They need more professional engineers. If you're looking for a change of pace and you want to work somewhere where they prioritize people over profits and really work to maximize your potential, look no further than the careers link at apexautomation.ca. We've got an exciting announcement from our friends at Friesen Brothers. You know they are Alberta-grown and Alberta-owned. I'm going to have to change my scripts here when it comes to Friesen Brothers. I've been telling you about their 16 locations across the province, but guess what? As of Saturday, April 12th, that number bumps up. Their 17th store opens Friesen Brothers Glenora, a local reference for those of you in the Metro Edmonton region. 142nd Street, 107th Ave on the traffic circle will never be the same. The sourdough sandwich station, the pizza oven, the wine bar, and don't even get me started on the butcher shop. It all opens April 12th. Friesen Brothers Glenora, our congratulations to that family-owned business in advance. And all this talk about sustainability and sustainable design. 
How does that fit with landscaping? I had a wonderful conversation with Mike the other day. You know him, the owner-operator at Eden Landscaping. And Mike was talking to me about how him, his team of designers, are really working to better understand the implications of drought and how drought realities will factor into landscape design. That's something that they're ahead of the curve on. A custom builder with more than 20 years of experience in Edmonton and area. If you want to better understand how your front or backyard could better contribute to sustainability right there, your family's own footprint, what a conversation in store you've got with Eden Landscaping. Again, you can get that conversation started at landscapeedmonton.ca. Andre, let me ask you first. Andre Aslan joining us from the Alberta Water Council. Uh, the United Nations World Water Day, March 22nd. Uh, the main theme in 2024 is water for peace. Uh, how does that resonate with you? Well, I mentioned it earlier that it's water is critical to everyone, so it's something we can all relate to and I think be sympathetic to each other about. Uh, and so I, I think of some of the, the conflict areas that are around water, um, and yet somehow it, it's, it's sort of worked out. And so I look at, um, you know, in the Indus Valley between Pakistan and India, okay, they've got a, a water sharing agreement that, that, they've, that has survived through two wars um, because it's critical to everyone. So um, when you think about the, the other, the interrelationships between people and um, how we can connect to each other and how that impacts our, our daily lives and thoughts, uh, in terms of drawing attention to it, Water for Peace is something to strive for, I think. Um, that, that's kind of my take home from it. Mm. D- does it resonate with you in any way? I mean, personally or professionally, Mark? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, you know, Andre took a great global perspective. I'm going to maybe bring it a little bit uh, home domestically and, and think about peace sort of from a different perspective. Um, absolutely. You know, I think um, when you think about water, when you think about energy industry, when you think about uh, anything else, there is so much polarization in the conversation. And it's hard to believe that there's any middle ground between the two ends of the spectrum, between those who say we need to absolutely shut everything down or there's no need to mitigate any of the impacts that are that are happening or everything is kind of hunky-dory as it is. And so when I think about peace, I think um, and, and water, again, I, I sort of think about this no silver bullet answer and, and it, it's a little bit, we all have a role to play. There's an opportunity for innovation. There's an opportunity to, to have both and let's have a meaningful conversation sort of in the, in the middle, I hate to say, but in, in the middle of the idea to say, okay, how do we, we will have to probably make some tough decisions. There will be some difficult decisions and there are some, some people that may not get the water that they would otherwise love to have. Or I shouldn't say people because again, um, people deserve uh, clean and safe drinking water, but there will be some areas that, that may have to have difficult decisions made about it. But I think that we can have, as you, as you talked about, we can have both a thriving industry, livelihood for our citizens and have uh, a healthy, healthy aquatic ESO ecosystems going to the future and have water access for all. And so it, for, in my sense, you know, I'm, I'm going to shy away from the indictment and, and, mm-hmm. and say more so that I think as a tool for kind of local political peace, um, um, th- there's a real good conversation that can happen at, you know, somewhere in the middle of the spectrum to, to create that peace and create the path forward. Mm. Scott, how does that land with you? Yeah, I mean, the the perspectives here that Andre and Mark have provided are, are excellent. And, and, you know, it. I think that what we've heard and it, how it lands with me is that water is is everywhere and it affects everyone. And so, you know, water is very much uh, life and then we've also you know talked a, a bit about sustainability and so i think that you know we need to to think about how we can meet the needs uh, of present time uh, without really compromising uh, the future uh, water needs uh, for future generations yeah this is uh, obviously um, we would call it dynamic subject matter in that the the uh, the storylines will evolve and shift and uh, certainly remain uh, there's no doubt about that. And I'm grateful that the three of you have made yourselves available. You, you've got us thinking about a million different things. Uh, if I know anything about this audience, they're, they're Googling and, and leveling up their knowledge and understanding of different issues. Hopefully this roundtable has put some things on folks' radar that wasn't there before. And no doubt there are things that we did not discuss today that we need to talk about. I mean, we, we, we need to have full episodes and full discussions about water security in Canada, in particular, indigenous, indigenous communities. I know that the federal government has 
has pledged uh, to have those, you know, those water advisories removed from dozens and dozens and dozens of, of First Nation uh, communities. Uh, th- there has been some progress made there, but obviously not enough. That's something that's on our radar. I want to let our audience know that. But let us know what we've missed. Let us know what we've not been talking about. What does World Water Day mean to you? Uh, We're going to leave some time open on Friday's episode. That will be March 22nd, World Water Day. And we'd love to include your perspective in this conversation. I want to thank everybody that was joining us in the YouTube live chat and on Mixler. Make sure you hit like. Make sure you subscribe to Real Talk on YouTube or wherever you're getting your podcasts. And share this episode with somebody that you know will benefit from hearing this conversation. Uh, we're grateful that Andre Aslan's made time for us from the Alberta Water Council. I'm not sure that anybody on my uh, that I know is more passionate about water. No, with, with apologies to you two and, and much respect, Scott and Mark. But Andre's emailing me all the time about water. Love and it. I love your passion. <laughs> I, yeah, I just absolutely love it, 100%. Uh, Dr. Mark Summers, uh, really great work, and thanks for joining us here on behalf of Alberta Innovates. Uh, that's where Mark is uh, Associate VP for Ag and Environment. And, of course, Dr. Scott Katchis and joining us uh, remotely uh, out of Athabasca University. Scott, thanks for making time for us and for clearing your schedule to be part of this conversation. We appreciate it. Of course. Thanks very much, Ryan, for the opportunity. And thanks to the other uh, fellow panelists here. I think it's been a really uh, excellent and engaging discussion. So thanks to everyone. Yeah, you got it. And so let's all pledge uh, as we wrap here today that, uh, I don't know, I'm thinking of that scene from Aaron Brockovich. You probably all know exactly what I'm talking about, right? The next time you go to the tap, pour yourself a glass of water and just put it right to your lips and you're getting set to take that drink. Let's not take for granted where it came from. All the steps that it went through, the stones it went over to get to us and what happens after it goes down the drain. Let's be good stewards of our water. Let's get in this one together. We know that is the inevitability of this all. Thanks for being part of the conversation. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, executive producer Josh Dunford, 